wardens, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, pray silence for the master. I'll repeat it. Wardens, fellow liverymen, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to our annual agricultural lecture here at the magnificent Plasterers Hall. It says Plasterers on the paper, but we pronounce it Plasterers. Particular thanks go to Frontier Agriculture, thank you, as being our main sponsors for this evening and for the other companies who have taken corporate tables. On behalf of the Worshipful Company of Farmers, I hope you all have an enjoyable and stimulating evening. As you can see at the back, we are video recording the event, so um, that isn't to so that you can fall asleep during the, my presentation or during Dieter's. It is because we're sending it out on YouTube, and also we will be doing it out via other media channels. So um, it is going to be recorded during the evening. This year's lecture has already been rolled forward twice due to COVID restrictions. I am particularly pleased that my first choice lecturer, Professor Sir Dieter Helm, has stuck with us to present his latest thinking this evening. Sir Dieter is a very busy man. He's been at meetings all day today, hence the lounge suit. And he has to depart after the Q&A. So thank you, Dieter, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be here this evening. The planet, human beings, and the food supply chain will face many challenges in the coming years, somewhat caused by our excessive use of the Earth's resources and continually increasing expectations. Goodness knows what will happen if the underdeveloped economies join the same train that the West and developed Asia are on. We even have the bizarre situation at present where there is too much CO2 in the atmosphere and not enough bottled CO2 for the food, industrial and medical sectors. In a post-Brexit Britain, we cannot blame Brussels for our woes. Conversely, we can't save the world on our own. I wonder if the Glasgow COP26 summit will really produce a global commitment to change the world and save our grandchildren's future, or will we yet again kick the can down the road? The NFU have set themselves a very ambitious target of net zero by 2040. That's less than a generation away, and the clock is ticking. There are so many carbon calculators to choose from, so it's confusing which emissions associated with food production should farmers include. Like many of us here, I'm well aware of the problems, but am I prepared to pay the cost or make the sacrifices to deliver the solutions? Can we afford to wait for the technology? We certainly can't afford to wait for the politicians to deliver on their populist prevarications. So what are the answers? Sometimes, we need to call on people who think differently to the herd. One of those is Professor Sadita Helm. Sadita is Professor of Economic Policy at the University of Oxford and Fellow in Economics at New College, Oxford. He has advised UK and EU governments on energy, the environment, climate change, and natural capital. Dieter has advised the present government on their 25-year environmental plan, the new agricultural policy of public money for public good and elms. He has many academic papers to his name, as well as several books, the latest one being Net Zero, How We Stop Causing Climate Change. With a name like Dieter, you might be surprised that he grew up in Essex. Dieter's father was a prisoner of war, working on farms in East Anglia. His father then married an English girl, a farmer's daughter, with 350 acres, and his father set up growing mushrooms on the Essex marshes. When he was young, Dieter asked his father 
why had been given a German name. His father replied that it was to ensure he stayed away from politics. <laughs> Dieter confesses that tactic was a complete failure. By his own admission, Professor Helm considers himself as somewhat an outsider. Dieter, that's one of the main reasons I wanted you to be our guest lecturer this evening. Too often, in our farming, political or social circles, we exchange views with people who think like us. I do like to be challenged with alternative thoughts and I hope you will enjoy listening to our guest lecturers different, if somewhat challenging, views this evening. With the title, The Future of Farming, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome one of today's key influencers in our sector, our guest lecturer, Professor Sir Dieter Helm. extremely kind words. Thank you very much um, for inviting me uh, to speak this evening and thanks for your patience and forbearance that we've gone through several iterations to get to this stage. But ladies and gentlemen, what I'd like to do this evening is take you away from the day-to-day -day trials and tribulations of modern farming life and ask you to think from the future back to the present. When most people talk about the future of anything, they talk about what they want to happen now, and they talk about the past, and they look out the back window of the car. What we should do is do it exactly the other way around. So I put to you, imagine yourself in 2050, surveying the English, Scottish, Welsh, Irish, um, uh, farming landscape, and ask yourself, what might it look like then? And then work back to the present. Do it the other way around. And I sometimes do this with my students. Uh, most of my students were born in 2000 or afterwards. Uh, I find that deeply shocking. Uh, to them, uh, when I think of the equivalent, it's the Suez Crisis, which was something I read about in the history books. Mrs. Thatcher is something from the historic past. Um, but I often say to them, you know, you carry on with your laptops, your iPhones, your social media, etc. I did my thesis on an Olympic portable, Olympus portable typewriter with Tipex and carbon paper. And they think I really am a dinosaur. <laughs> but if you think about it in a 30 year perspective, that's about the kind of time horizon that you think from 250 back to now. There was no internet, there were no iPhones, there were no laptops in 1990. I did my thesis a bit before then. Um, and look what's happened since. So I would like you to start by imagining yourself at that future date. And of course, it's speculation. I could never have known what the internet and what Twitter and things like that would deliver when I was doing my thesis, and we can't know all the opportunities that are out there in front of us. But we can hypothesise about some of the big ticket items. The most important, the most transformational thing for the farming sector is the one which historically has been both that important and most neglected in discussions. It's technology and technical progress. My grandfather said that when he started his farm in the 20s and 30s on the Essex marshes, there were 20 people looking after the horses on 350 acres. Tractors completely transformed, ploughing heavy clay, heavy wet clay in winter on the Essex marshes. Fossil fuels made farming something completely different from what it was in the past. It was once manpower and horsepower. It's now all machinery. It's all fossil fuel driven. There are virtually no modern farms powered by animals. 
and human labour has become something people do in overalls, uh, listening in smart air conditioning cabs, etc. I exaggerate, of course. But I want you to think forward. And there are two areas of technology we know are going to transform agriculture. One of them is genetics, and whether people want to have an argument about GMOs and gene editing, etc., all of which are incredibly important and have deep ethical issues associated with them, the genie's out of the box. All those skills that once farmers honed about knowing how to select, how to breed, how to produce those wonderful specimens at Royal Shows are now replaced in an instant by the genomes or the potential genomes of virtually everything. Think back just a few years. The human genome was a great breakthrough to be able to plot that. Now my colleagues in Oxford, in less than 10 days, can map the genetics of the coronavirus and produce a vaccine. That's transformational technical change. And it's just beginning. And it has, as I say, deep ethical issues associated with it. But I doubt in 2050, the sorts of discussions we're having today on genetic issues will be part of the core agenda. We'll have been way past that. And that means the possibilities are enormous as to what we can do. The second technical change is digitalization. I mentioned my typewriter and the coming of, of laptops and things of that ilk. We can now digitalize anything. We can create a digital image of anything on this planet. We can also map digital digitally every one of your farms, every one of the fields, and we're pretty close to matching every hedge and every tree as well. That's completely new. You'll be able to digitally plot what's going on in your soils. You'll have an enormous information base to work from. I don't doubt in 250 that maths graduates, probably from Oxford rather than Cambridge, will be part and parcel of the fabric of any modern farm. And that's not just robotics, although that's incredibly important. It's right down to the detailed substance of all the component parts. And think of the data that's going to be available. Well, it already is. Think what big data does. Think what AI is going to do. How much information is going to be able to crunch on every bit of our natural capital and our lab. So that's all coming. And quantum computing is pretty much on the board. And quantum computing is just an order of magnitude different from what we now know as current computing power. That's going to be the world in 250 for some of you and lots of your successors. And some of us will be around to see it and some of us maybe not. It's a generation away. But it's coming fast, quick and dramatic. Now we also know, against that technological background, but the climate's going to be different. You have to be pretty stubborn and pretty unscientific to think that the temperature is not going to go up. Indeed, it's likely we'll cross 1.5 degrees at least one year in the next five. So all this talk about we're going to hold the line at 1.5 degrees. No, we've already crossed one and we've almost done the 0.5 to add to it. So the land, the landscape, the growing seasons, the warmer winters, the rainfall, the hotter summers, all of that is going to be part and par parcel of agriculture in 250. And whatever we do about climate change, bluntly, a hell of a lot of it is inevitable. And that will change agriculture globally and it'll change the global markets within which people will farm in 250. When it comes to nature and natural capital, it's not clear what it's going to look like in 250. It's not clear if the destruction that we've brought on our land in the last 50, 60, 70 years is going to continue. But it is not wrong to talk about the invertebrate Armageddon there are studies from Germany showing even in nature reserves, 
in farming areas, some 60, 70, 80, perhaps more percent of invertebrates have disappeared in the last few decades. Everyone can see it. As a child, I drove around and we used to stop to clean the insects off the windscreen. I never do that nowadays. There aren't any insects to clean off. And we are on course, as a planet, to destroy a vast amount of the biodiversity of this world. A lot of it's in rainforests, they're coming down fast. You can go and use that digital satellite data to watch them burning. And you can see the damage. And the question is out there as to whether farming can survive without the insect populations and the supporting biodiversity to make thriving soils, thriving natural capital, which is the bedrock of any farm. Farming is about natural capital, it is natural capital, to make sure that, that, that that's going to be there in place. And of course there are some very great techno-optimists, and I'm not a techno-optimist, I'm just trying to suggest the technology that might happen. But there are some who think that the genetic sciences, etc., will solve this. You can bring back the woolly mammoth. Oh, come on. You know, this is much more serious than that. And it's not clear what's going to happen on that front. And that's why, frankly, here, the biodiversity is local as well as global. The 25-year plan is incredibly important for the future of farming. And it has to succeed if farming is to have the natural capital to build upon. And then there's population. You know, back in 1900, into the 1920s, when all those horses were on the land and the tractors weren't there, in 1900 there were two billion people on the planet. When I was born, there was five point some, uh, sorry, 3.5. 3.5. Now there's seven plus. And although there's a lot of evidence that population growth is slowing down, and it could be disastrous for the Chinese in particular, um, 9 billion seems extremely likely. And these people not only want food, the product of agriculture, they want your and my lifestyle too. And anyone who does the most trivial iota of maths can work out what consumption looks like if the world economy grows at 3 to 4% cumulative for 50 or years, 100 years, or just 30 years. You know, China was doubling in size every seven years from 1980 onwards. Just think about that. Right? China projects forward that it's going to peak its, climate, its carbon emissions in 2030. Well, even at its current lower growth rate, by 230, we'll be well on the way to two Chinas, compared with about 218, 217. So just imagine going out there into the Pacific and seeing another China and the consumption that goes with it. And think about the demand that comes with that. Now, in the world of 2050, unless there's some cataclysmic pandemic or something, all those extra people and all their extra consumption is going to be out there. Now I've laboured that because I want to put that perspective out there so that it's against that perspective we look at what we're doing now. So now come back from that future to now, the present. And what historians will write about the present when it comes to farming and land use is that this was one of the great pivotal moments, 1947-48, and 2000, roughly. These are the moments where really substantial change took place. British agricultural policy after the war was entirely driven by production. I remember when my grandfather's farm was sold in the late 60s, I remember Almost all the hedges were dynamited. A large field was created, utterly destroyed by the salt winds off the marshes, devastating in terms of the damage done. I remember the mole drains going in, all paid for by grants. And you look across Britain, where I now have a house in Exmoor, the punch bowl, if anyone knows Exmoor, that great feature, was ploughed under government grants. 
That was a policy with a clear objective, and much of the objective was achieved, and the destruction, when people think that, oh, it's all the Europeans' fault with the common agricultural policy, the destructive nature of British agricultural policy after the Second World War was terrible for natural capital and the environment. 1973, 1973, 1974, joining the EU, we joined the CAP. And the CAP started off being just like the British policy, driven by production subsidies, and we ended up with the butter mountains, the wine lakes. I always wanted to find the wine lake. It always intrigued me enormously. I think I was more of a student in those days, and it was really quite exciting. Um, but we had these surpluses which came as a result of using direct intervention to support prices. And we ended up with a common agricultural policy which paid most of the money to people to own land. Now whatever it meant for the individual economics of farms, that cannot be a way of supporting farming in the future. You can't pay people to own land in a democracy where other people need health care, education care, social care, and lots of other things. It's completely unsupportive, and if I had the time I'd explain to you the economics of why much of that's reflected in land prices and why that price new entrants out of the farms. The common agricultural policy in the end ended up having to subsidise young farmers to get into farming because the land prices were too high for young farmers to farm. That's about as silly as it gets. And Brexit came along, and whatever one's views about Brexit, you could argue that the one or two things that Brexit offered was the opportunity to get out of the crazy economics of the common agricultural policy, and indeed also get out of the common fisheries policy. Now, just for the record, because you have to do this, it's like saying, you know, I'm not a racist or whatever else. <laughs> I am a Remainer. <laughs> But with a name like mine and a history of what the EU did to incorporate East Germany and Eastern Europe without violence and accommodate the destruction of the Soviet Union into a peaceful Europe from which many of you benefited from the labour supplies that flowed and no longer do, I'm unashamedly uh, remain a person for political reasons, not party political reasons, but political reasons about some of the great things the EU did. But we get out of the CAP. So we have to reinvent because Brussels did our agricultural policy and did our environmental policy for 30, 40 years. We had to reinvent a new British agricultural policy and a new environment policy. And I'll come on to the other building block, which is the net zero block as well. And we now have, and this is why it's a historical point, the substantive building blocks in legislation which, is, which are very, very likely to be with us in 230 and probably 240. Once every 30 years we have a spasm of legislation in these areas and most of the building blocks in legal terms are now in place. So in that path to 250 and future farming, this is what we have to work with. There is no going back on what's been put in place. And that's the Agricultural Act. It'll be the Environment Act by the end of the year or the beginning of next year. And of course we have the 219 Amendment to the Climate Change Act, which makes net zero a legal requirement for 250. So we have climate law, environment law, and agricultural law in place. And of course we can have planning reform as well, I won't say much about net biodiversity gain, but that's an important component within the, this frame. Now, lots of people complain about each bit of this legislation. They either think it doesn't go far enough, or they think it goes too far, in all three cases. But legislation is never about the perfect. It's like farming. You, know, you can always work out what a perfect solution to farming a piece of land is, but it ain't like that. It's practical. It's trial and error. You compromise. You put things in place which are acceptable, not perfect. And so anyone who expects these, pieces of these bits of legislation to be all embracing and comprehensive and do exactly the right things is really not on the practical planet 
certainly that I like to play on, but that we all are um, uh, uh, based upon. So let me say a bit about each of these bits of legislation, since they are you know, out there, like the post-war legislation, like the EU legislation in the majority. The Agricultural Act is, at best, a framework. It sets out principles, but almost all the substance of the agricultural policy is yet to be defined. It's all to play for in the detail. But the central principle, which I'm proud to have a lot to do with, is public money for public goods. It is not public money for private goods. And economists mean something very special when they say public goods, and they do not, as a number of interested parties have suggested, confuse it with the public interest. It's in the public interest to have food production, but food is a private good. Public goods are things the market will not produce without intervention. And huge parts of our natural environment, our biodiversity, our landscapes, etc., are public goods rather than private goods. Now, I certainly didn't invent this idea. This was actually in a Treasury paper, this principle, when the Treasury was trying to influence a reform of the Common Agricultural Policy in about 2005. So this isn't recently invented. This was at the heart of government uh, quite a long time ago. So it's there. The second principle, which is echoed in the Environment uh, Bill and lurks behind the surface of this, is polluter pays. An efficient economy is where all the costs in the economy are incorporated in the market prices. And I'll come on in a moment, polluter pays is fantastically challenging to farming. It's one of the very few sectors where the polluter expects to be paid not to pollute. If you said that in the energy sector, people would think you came from another planet. But farmers expect, you want me to not pollute the water systems? Then subsidise me to do things which won't cause those outcomes. This is a very challenging um, principle for the farming sector, but it will come. Now, within that framework of the um, uh, Agriculture Act, we have the Elms schemes. And we have Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 3, instead of Pillar 1, Pillar 2. Now, Elms is pregnant with the possibility of being an incredibly forward-thinking policy framework to help us on the path to 250. It's also perfectly possible to be subverted into a modern version of the CAP. So I think it's up for grabs as well the Sustainable Farming Initiative, which I suspect will end up being most of the money under the Elm scheme, is basically pillar one with a bit more cross-compliance, or whether it's genuinely public money for public goods. And I read the Secretary of State's interview with Country Life. I think when ministers go and talk to things to papers like Country Life, they think people might not notice, but I do. Um, uh, and it's not because Country Life wrote nice things about me once, so I'm somewhat biased in that direction. Um, uh, um, you can see how much I search for the odd uh, compliment. Um, so he said, this is going to be farmer-led. Every farmer's going to have their own tame consultant who's going to walk the land, come up with a farm plan. This isn't about measuring hedgerows or anything like that. I slightly paraphrased the words, but they're not far off. Well, I think that's called, how much money were you getting under pillar one before? Can we give you the same amount of money as well? And could you do a few nice extra things to get the cash? What a waste that would be. What a terrible waste of the opportunity in front of us. But I think as 50-50, that's what's gonna happen. And when you look at tier two and tier three, aren't they pillar two? Aren't they quite similar? And there is a thing about revolutions. I recall reading a history of the French Revolution. So 
So they all started off with the idea, we don't like kings, we're going to chop their heads off. And they did. And 15 years later, they ended up with the next Louis on the throne. Revolutions go through their initial bout, and then all the lobbyists and interests claw back the position. And the situation ex post is not the same as the position ex ante, but it can often end up remarkably similar. That would be a huge missed opportunity for our natural capital, for the future of our landscape, for the future of farming, um, and a huge tragedy for those who expected that Brexit might deliver positive outcomes while they wait for the lorry drivers and the pickers and look at the crops in the fields and wonder why uh, it was such a good idea uh, to uh, cut ourselves off from uh, our fellow Europeans. But that's an aside. And controversial now. Yes. So that's the Agricultural Act. We take the next one, net zero. Now, net zero is something which, as far as I can work out, everyone's in favour of and virtually nobody understands. It's a great slogan, isn't it? It's like sustainability. You can't be in favour of not being sustainable, right? You've got to be in favour of net zero. The um, chairman of the Climate Change Committee wrote in the introduction to the document which was used to persuade the government to adopt net zero uh, uh, that, quote, when we get to zero, we will no longer be causing climate change. I was so angry when I read that, that I wrote my book about the subject. <laughs> we are never going to get to zero, and we never should. This is net zero. This is about sequestration and emissions. That's what climate change results from, the balance of those things. For hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years, that balance between sequestration and emissions has what's produced the climate which has enabled modern agriculture to function and our world to be what it is. But the really damaging bit is the bit about we will no longer be causing climate change. I slightly facetiously suggested that if you really wanted to make sure that you got to net zero um, quickly, you should hope that Brexit will finish off the car industry, you should close down Grangemouth, uh, the Ineos plant in Scotland, and you should get rid of the fertiliser industry and one or two others. And indeed, look at our country, we're 80% services. No wonder our emissions are falling. But do you think we're using any less steel, aluminium, fertilisers, petrochemicals, cement? Absolutely not. It's carbon consumption that counts, not carbon production. It doesn't matter where that cow produced the methane, whether it's on a Welsh hillside or a Brazilian bit of cleared rainforest. Indeed, it's much worse in the Brazilian circumstance because the rainforest has been cleared as well. You can see why it makes one angry. Because most of the British public think that pursuing this policy is actually going to stop causing climate change. And they've been understandably led to that point. Let me put it to you. For the last 30 years, we've added two parts per million to the carbon concentration of the atmosphere. And it's the carbon concentration of the atmosphere which causes climate change. That is the greenhouse effect. Last year, 2020, we added two parts per million. There isn't a single blip, not even the financial crisis, in the increase in concentration of carbon in the atmosphere. And when we blame China, and there are lots of things wrong with China, next time you buy something in the shop and it says made in China, ask who caused the emissions. You, for your consumption, or some Chinese worker who worked in the factory. So, on net zero, if we really want to take climate change seriously, we have to engage and engage in the consumption side of this equation. Now this matters for farmers enormously, because it's no good pursuing virtue in Britain and cutting back the emissions in order to import the stuff from somewhere else where even more emissions have been involved, never mind the transport. This would be a terrible environmental thing to do. But that's actually where we're heading. And I'm not going to go into the welfare arguments, those are separate and there are all sorts of complexities that happen. There are plenty of people here who know more about that than I do, but I do have views on that. You'd be surprised. Um, but on the climate change side, that's why you have to have a carbon border adjustment. It's not hard to solve this problem. 
You just charge the same price for carbon on imports as you charge for domestic production. Then we're on a level playing field and we can talk about trade. But you don't say we'll have cows for clunkers or cows for cars with Brazil, as the EU deal suggests, while they're merrily burning down bits of the rainforest and putting cattle ranches on them and then selling the cattle to us here with all the emissions that go with it. And we say, oh, we're doing net zero. We've cut down our emissions on our British farms. We're doing the right thing. Aren't we world leaders in climate change? No, 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 we're not. And that's why the trade issues, which are one of the two great Brexit challenges for farming, are not about so-called free trade. They're about genuinely economic efficient trade, you could call it fair trade, where people pay similar costs for the pollution they cause. And that would be quite difficult for some British farmers in some circumstances, and some intensive producers, but not all. And that has to be taken on board. Now I'd say one more thing about net zero and pollution. Agriculture, relative to its size in the economy, is the sector that's by far the biggest climate change emitter of carbon. It's 0.5% of GDP, and it produces a recorded 11% of total emissions. The power sector is only 19%, but this is 0.5% of the economy. So relative to its size, farming has got a huge pollution problem. And this leads back to my polluter pays point. It's all very well to say you're going to be net zero in 240, because the assumption that many people make is that people are going to turn out and trot out pay farms loads of money to sequestrate carbon. But of course you can't charge farmers for the pollution that they're causing, which is the parallel policy, pay for the sequestration and charge for the emissions. So what do farmers do? They campaign, they campaign to keep red diesel. How do you keep red diesel at half price diesel in a world in which you want to be net zero? You can't have your cake and eat it too. You're going to have to pay for the emissions that are caused, you're going to have to get rid of the emissions that are caused, and you're going to get a great opportunity to sequestrate carbon going forward and get paid for doing that. It's both sides of the equation, not one. And I have to say too, that the 11% is probably, in my view, almost certainly, a serious underestimation of the emissions from farming. Why? Because the emissions from soils and peats are not properly measured. A rough rule of thumb is that soil, roughly on average, has three to four times the carbon of the atmosphere. So when you go through the fenlands and you see the peat blowing off, and you see the posts that show how far the land's dropped because the peat's gone, that's like a row of coal power stations. That's how you should think about it, because that's doing just as much damage to the, car, to the climate as Drax is doing up in the north. These are hard realities that the farming community, that agriculture is going to have to come to terms with if it genuinely wants to be net zero and make its contribution. And it's the emissions which we should start with because they're so big, whereas the sequestration takes time. But the sequestration opportunities are enormous too. Now, I haven't mentioned planning. I'll, I'll finish on the legislative bit with um, the environment bill and then I'll sum up. So the third bit of the equation, the new legal framework for the future of farming, is the environment bill. Now, although I've had quite a lot to do with the agriculture bill and the act, the environment bill is the area where I've most concentrated. And as chair of the Natural Capital Committee, we proposed the 25-year environment plan. And we advised Michael Gove as to how to incorporate it in the bill. And it's one of those once-in-a-lifetime flukes. You actually propose something that's actually going to happen, as opposed to write it in a nice university academic paper and hope someday someone will look at it. So, of all that I've described, the Environment Bill is probably the most important. And it creates a set of statutory targets, which I suspect many across the farming community will um, find out they have to live with. It proposes statutory targets for water, statutory targets for air quality, 
statutory targets for waste and statutory targets for biodiversity on top of the statutory targets for carbon. Of course, nobody's worked out what those targets are and the practicalities of what needs to be done to put them in place, but there's the Office of Environmental Protection on top to enforce that on public bodies and therefore environment agency, natural environment, etc. Now, of course, it's been watered down. They always are. The idea is that the Office of Environmental Protection will only act if it's given guidance by the Secretary of State. But anyone who's listened to the debates in the House of Lords knows that isn't going to last for very long, even if it goes through now. It will have its independence. It will drive forward the 25-year plan. It will have to report, as we put in place the framework for, on progress towards the 25-year plan. And it will therefore have to uh, account for how far we, in our current generation, are bequeathing the next generation a set of natural capital at least as good as we got. And it's not good natural capital that we got, because a lot of damage has been done. And that's our duty. Farmers are stewards of the land. If farming doesn't drive this through, and if farming doesn't protect those natural capital assets, well, who else is going to? And farmers know that stewardship. That's why we have family farms. That's why we have connections through the generations. It's about looking after the land. So there should be nothing unnatural about farming embracing natural capital. The soils and the water systems, etc., which are part and parcel of the basic factors of production for farming. So that's all there in the Environment Bill. And of course you might be thinking, what about food? What about food production? Isn't that what farming's supposed to do? It's all very well for the Climate Change Committee to say 9% of land has to go over to climate change mitigation by 2035, and 21% by 2050. How, how they know what's going to be in 250 is another game. But, um, uh, if you want predictions of the future, I think the Energy White Paper tells us that in 2050 smart technology will create 15,000 jobs. You just wonder what planet these brilliant people are on. Will they know how many jobs a sector will create in 30 years' time? Never mind. Um, uh, but come back to the point. Food production is the core of this. And that's where the linkage comes between what I said at the beginning about the changes that will be there in 250 and now. One thing that will be true in 250 is food production won't look like it does now. It will be a very different kind of activity. Of course, there will be traditional farming practices, but if you think what this technology is going to do, I think um, it was put to me uh, recently, uh, I may have even quoted this in a book, um, that if you take one of the largest landed estates in Britain, and you look at the protein production from all its beef, sheep, uh, and cattle, and compare it with one small insect factory in France, France has it on the protein front. That's staggering. Right? Now, I'm not suggesting we're all going to eat insects, so I bet a lot of you will be eating insects in various forms. You probably just won't realise it in the forms of the ways in which uh, uh, modern science reconstructs things. But if it's a, a volume of food that's required, the big question is, will food need less land to produce the same or more protein, carbohydrates, etc., than it does now? And my guess is that we'll need less land to produce more food. I'm not saying it's all going to be indoor vertical farming, though if any of you ever go up to the John Hutton Institute, uh, up in Dundee and have a look at what a, a small indoor vertical farm looks like. Um, this is not science fiction and all produced by renewable solar power too. Um, there are huge ways in which we can improve because, you know, I go back to uh, my father's mushroom farm. It was all indoors. There wasn't any, you know, there wasn't much land involved. We produced a huge quantity of protein. We used to have an advert at the time, which I'm sure was um, stretching the truth, that, you know, more protein than beef steak. Um, but, you know, you start to think about how this works. Farming as it is today is subject to the vagaries of the weather and being outside. Of course, most of it will be in the future, but not all. 
And that's where you get back to the central tension for farming in the future. How much land and how does growing food on land trade off against using land for carbon purposes, using land primarily for biodiversity purposes, using land for building purposes, etc. And I think that's the beginning of the debate from where we go forward. And my key point is this isn't static. This is dynamic and it's technologically driven. So, of course food is important. Not because self-sufficiency matters. You know, contrary to Jeremy Clarkson, we're unlikely to be starved to death by the Germans. My fellow compatriots are not about to arrive and put a blockade around Britain and sink the convoys. You know, a modern war will take a few days to close down the entire IT systems and you won't have time to starve to death. Okay. I'm pretty clear in my mind about that. We may well produce more of our own food, but not for security reasons, but for the reasons that once you take the carbon content of trade into account, and many of the environmental consequences of the palm oil, the stuff that comes from the rainforest, etc., it will be better for the environment to produce it here. And I think the very powerful argument which pushes towards the popular idea of local actually being sensible economics. So I wouldn't be at all surprised if this notion of percentage goes up, but not because we should fear being invaded. Sadly, we just won't have the time to be starved to death. And that's not the way we should think about land use. And I always say to people who think that it's self-sufficiency that matters, you know, think how much of our land is not actually used to dig for victory. Think how much just of the total land is given over to gain. I mean, in Exmoor, it's mostly gain. Right? Employs people, has a whole industry with it, has all sorts of uh, benefits and costs. But nobody seriously thinks that the uplands of, uh, of Exmoor are really seriously about self-sufficiency of food. Think how much is going down to bio crops. Think how much wheat goes into making fields. You know, we don't, if you really seriously were worried about self-sufficiency, a huge number of current practices would go, and you would have to think seriously about the supply chain. That fertiliser factory, remind us, is not just the farming that security depends upon, it's the inputs, the tractors, the fertilisers, the chemicals, etc. And I hope that we'll have a policy which is not any more just in time, but people have learned from all the supply and cons system constraints that we ought to think a bit more about just in case. And I predict that that will be a much more popular phrase, just in case, in the future, given the lessons of the recent past. Though I have to say, the food supply system stood up remarkably well to the COVID lockdowns. It's incredible that supermarkets' shelves were mostly full for most of the time, despite the greatest interruption to supply chains since the Second World War. So, the future... Some of it can be sketched ahead. Technology is crucial, not as a techno-optimist, it's just there is going to be a lot of technical change that's coming. The climate's going to be different. Nature has huge challenges associated with it, and there'll be a lot more food, a lot more people for food to feed. The main building blocks are now in place to get from here to there. Those are the three bits of legislation. The implementation's all to come in order to make sure that we achieve particularly the carbon objectives but the others too we need to think very hard about what genuinely efficient trade looks like and it doesn't look like a free-for-all which some of our ministers seem to think nor does it look like protectionism which some others of vested interests would also have us do border taxes are absolutely essential and what we have is a choice after Brexit, with our new legislation, is the chance to choose whether, for the next generation, 2050 and beyond, we leave at least as good natural capital for them as we've got, and actually start to make good some of the damage. We do our best not to do more damage to the climate for them. We do our best not to do more damage to biodiversity and use the framework of creating food 
to fit within that, whether, as I put it in my earlier book, we have a green and prosperous land. It's easy to be pleasant, but the, um, the slogan which the NFU uh, put forward, which is, you can't be green if you're in the red, is true. You have to have prosperity in order for this to work. Uh, it's absolute spot on. And we can be green and prosperous, but not like we have been in the past. Or we can stick our heads in the sand, defend all our best interests, try to make the future as much like the past as we possibly can, turn the revolution back to the, where it was, make the SFI like cap pillar one, etc. And it will be unsustainable. It will be brown and dirty. And I'll leave you with this comment. If it's unsustainable, it will not be sustained. You don't have a choice because the consequences will be such that you'll have to do the protection, support and enhancement of natural capital. It's just it's better to get on with it now than wait 10 years down the track and then clean up an even bigger mess later. So it's a huge opportunity. New markets, new ideas, new technologies, uh, uh, huge potential in the climate change space to do the sequestration, but responsibility too. Public goods, polluter pays, these are enormous challenges, but I'm very optimistic. They're fantastic opportunities for the farming sector. Thank you very much. One world has got to be where the solution lies, in my view, and that is probably the first great challenge. Now, if I can set out, please, there are two people with roving mics and paddles. Um, half a room each they're roughly going to take, so we're going to take questions alternately from each end. I'll try and keep the momentum going. Please, all of you, do yourselves a favour, do a favour for everybody else in the room. Short questions, and Dita, if we can get short answers as well, that's fantastic, because that will mean as many people as possible can get their questions in. We've got Dita Helm here as the main speaker, so I don't want any long pronouncements or statements from the floor. I hope you'll appreciate that, so please can we have our first questioner. One right in the corner there, please. Thank you. Uh, Kate Russell recently started a new business in natural capital, so fascinated by the topic. Um, Dieter, in Green and Prosperous Land, you, you advocate what I see as a pretty centrist kind of approach to natural capital. But could you expand on the role that you see for private landowners and farmers who actually manage most of the rural land in the UK? Do you see them just as servants of the state to deliver natural capital, or should they be more involved in decision making? Um, the, the short answer to that is, I mean, you know, most of the land in Britain, farmland, is privately owned. Private people running private land respond to the incentives in front of them. They run businesses, and where they deliver public goods, they should bid to provide those and be paid to do them. And where they produce private goods like food, etc., they should go for it, of course, subject to the regulatory framework and the prices for the pollution that are put in place. So subject to the carbon price, um, they should do whatever they think is appropriate. They know their land, farmers are the experts, everybody else is an amateur looking at what any particular farmer does um, and use the digital technology to map it. And what they should have is a balance sheet. The balance sheet should write down their natural capital and they should look at the renewable bits of that as assets in perpetuity their farm accounts should show their capital maintenance, and the bottom line after the capital maintenance is the profit and loss line, 
and farmers should maximise profits like anybody else. And actually, a lot assets in perpetuity and capital maintenance is accounting principles rather than historic costs is exactly the way in which farmers down the generation have implicitly thought because they want to maintain the assets intact for the next generation. Thank you very much. Tom Bradshaw, NFU Vice President and fellow Essex boy. Um, you, you talk about the public money for public goods, and look, I, I agree with the principle, but the challenge we're seeing today is that the payments simply are not going to be great enough to really reward farmers to going in and providing those public goods. You then talk about the, the carbon market there, and it seems like you're talking about a public carbon market, or, or do you think it's going to be a private carbon market? Because I think there's a real challenge here about where public meets private, because there's going to be all companies that have got their, their private offsetting they need to do around carbon. So there's got to be the ability to, for that to make, meet in the middle somewhere. The public and the private has got to match. And then finally on trade, you talk about there still, the, the still being this great opportunity. I'm afraid our government has thrown that away. You know, we had the opportunity to be genuine world leaders when we entered this new world. We could have set the standards for global ethical trade, but I'm afraid we've started a race to the bottom. How do we unwind that? So, um, excellent questions, and, and you pack them in. So, on the money, okay, there is a cost to producing public goods, and um, that will have to be paid for, and that's public money, and we'll have to find out what the balance is between the amount of money available and the amount of public goods that can be bought for that money. And the problem here is going to be not a kind of what's the all the project the net present value positive, but how much money is the Treasury going to have in total to subsidise agriculture? And those who voted for Brexit, good luck if you think that you've made an improvement by getting rid of the European Commission and having the Treasury in their place, given the financial crisis in front of us. Um, on the um, public versus private and the carbon markets, well, we have an emissions trading scheme, and like any market, there are no purely laissez-faire markets anywhere in the world. Markets work within the rules and regulations of the frame. The stock market is the most highly regulated market in the world, but it's also the most capitalist. Okay? So we need the rules of engagement. What constitutes a carbon offset? What constitutes the baseline for it? What the counterfactual is? How to evaluate um, the actual carbon sequestrated? How to do the capital maintenance? And crucially, what happens at the end of life of that asset? Okay? And also, what other damage might be done in the process? So I put it to you, if you want to sequestrate carbon as fast as possible, cover your farms with eucalyptus trees. It's the fastest known way on the planet to get trees to take up carbon. It'd be an unmitigated biological disaster. Okay? So what you have to do is think about all the natural capitals together, and what you need is a balanced outcome of that, which includes the value of the carbon sequestrated, which the landowner should be paid for. And I think that all these companies running around declaring they're net zero, going to be net zero by some day, many of them haven't got a clue how they're going to achieve it. And they know that actually they're just going to buy carbon offsets. If you go on a, uh, an airline flight to Hong Kong, it's something like $2 a ton or something. I mean, it's just nonsense, right? But the reality of this is there will be a market, there will be trades, there will be prices, and it will be a huge opportunity. But the corollary of that is there will be real penalties for the emissions side of it. So it's both sides of the equation. And on the farming trade thing, look, uh, ultimately, although I ho hope I'm practically minded, ultimately my job is to sit down and write down what <coughs> I think roughly the right answers to problems are. So I've spent a decade of my life arguing for carbon border adjustments. Um, I wrote my best paper on this in 2012. I argued at the Commission for this. OK, it's a decade later, but it is now the Commission's... A core part of its climate package is a carbon border adjustment. Progress. It won't be fast enough for you, and farmers are going to suffer the consequences of the kind of imperfect trade positions they're put in place. But at least I think that you don't disagree with me that it's the right answer to do it that way. And I will take that as enough. One over here, please. Uh, Richard Anscombe from Mid Suffolk. Sadita, you invited us to place ourselves forward into 2050. Yeah. 
And I'd be really interested to know um, if you're in 2050 here and now, what do you think you'd like the most about our life in 2050? And what do you think you'd like the least about the life in 2050? Well, um, I'll probably be somewhere in a churchyard in West Oxfordshire. <laughs> but just hypothesizing that I'm going to stretch longevity um, that far, and my student life will not finally catch up with me. Um, my, my answer to that question is, first of all, I suspect that some of the things that will be really fantastic in 250, we can't yet imagine. So I'm not a, tech, a techno-optimist in the sense of technology is going to solve everything, but you know, having access to every library in the world and every published work has transformed my life. And I really love that. You know, I can just press a button and, and, and have access to knowledge in a way that, you know, it must have been like when people first produced books. You know, it's a fantastic breakthrough. The other is, I hope that in 250, my grandchildren and their children will be able to go and see swallows coming into my barn. They will be seeing the barn now that I've got on my bit of land at the moment, and they'll be able to see thriving insect life, that they'll actually have some nature to appreciate. And, you know, it's often said, you know, farmers do lots of damage, etc. I've never heard a farmer who doesn't actually care about nature and, and like the fact that they can look at it and see it. Some bits of nature may be in the way, like aphids and some other things, but that's important. To me, that's preciously part of being a human being, being an animal with all the other animals and being able to see nature and enjoy it. And we know that that's important to people, and we know it especially during the coronavirus, how much people have appreciated that access. So I hope it's there. That's the bit I'm most doubtful about. But then most of the biodiversity is beneath your feet. So in my churchyard, I'll have the biodiversity much closer to me. <laughs> well, no um, thanks, Adito. I just wanted to up? ask you... Um, Can you stand up? Yep, thank you. I'll stand up. Thanks. Um, just on the, on the topic of public money for public goods, I, I'm starting to see quite a lot of contracts for private money for what we might have called public goods. Mm -hmm. So a lot of um, environmental, social, governance contracts yep. to buy yep. biodiversity. Yeah. performance, etc. And yeah. I just wondered, at what point, A, does it stop, from your point of view as an economist, being a public good, if yeah. the market is out there buying it? And secondly, whether that doesn't actually, by 2050, whether that isn't actually ha how we work, so that farmers are paid by the private sector to um, meet biodiversity targets, etc. And whether we don't actually, uh, it, it stops being a public good, and the market actually provides that through social pressure or indeed legislative pressure. Yeah, okay, so in my world, I start from the assumption that people per pursue their narrow self-interests and profit maximise, and loads of people do better than that. I'm Vice President of the Wildlife Trust, and very proud of what people put in in their own time for out without reward. That's a bonus, okay? But I think it's very dangerous to rely on altruism and charity, essentially, to deliver the outcome. Now on the companies that are paying for all this stuff and the ESG and all the things that go with it, okay, you have to ask why? What's the motivation? Why are they doing this? And are they doing it in a way which is actually going to get the better public goods on a system-wide basis? And most of these public goods are not isolated units. It's like in the net biodiversity game. It's not this housing estate versus this field, right? Environment happens in infrastructure systems of ecosystems, in river catchments, in upland areas. Okay? And the public dimension of this is to look at what the best use of the land is to produce the best public goods you can within the budget that's available to you. So when I look at some of the buying up biodiversity, right, um, some of it's just ego, some of it's extremely rich people playing games, and good luck to them. We've always had landowners who've had other altruistic intentions. In Scotland, it's a really big issue. I'm do, talking about that tomorrow. Um, and some of it's because they want to assuage their consciences for nasty things they're doing otherwise. So net biodiversity gain is because someone's doing biodiversity damage. Offsets are because someone's polluting. Okay? 
And you have to be very careful of the old church idea of buying indulgences. And there's a real greenwashing game out there of presenting what can be environmentally quite damaging activity. Oh, but it's all benign because we're doing all these other things. You know, oh Lord, I promise to stop sinning, but not yet, but I'll give you some money at the end of the church so you can pray for me afterwards. My Oxford College prays for the immortal soul of William of the Wickham, who was Bishop of Winchester and went round with William III, killing lots of French people in the Hundred Years' War. Right? Presumably the indulgence solves his problem, but you get where I'm going. Okay? And there's a huge amount of greenwash going on out there, and ESG is one of the most ill-defined set of concepts um, out there, and you know, one of the tasks is to take what is often a good idea and give it a bit of a context. So this thing comes out. My children always say it's much better when my microphone is turned off. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one down this end, please. Can you stand up and say your name? Uh, yes, uh, Theresa Wickham. First of all, thank you so much for such an awesome lecture. Um, the one point I wanted to ask you was a food security. You talked about capital side. Um, I'm a farmer, I produce food. How does the capital side that you're talking about relate to uh, food security within this country? Okay, um, so the best way I can think about that is <coughs> that what preserving and enhancing natural capital does, of which soil is the classic component for farming, is preserve and protect your potential to grow food in the future. Okay? We can all work out how to strip farm and get stuff out quickly. Once in, uh, uh, in ancient times, strip and burn agriculture, which would do that. In order to ensure that not just you can produce the food now, but the next generation can pursue it as well, the soil has to be in good heart. And one of the shortcuts in all of this, which is quite helpful, is that a very good measure of biodiversity in the soil is the amount of carbon in it. And that's also important for climate change, and it's also important for productivity. So looking after natural capital is one of the best ways of making sure you have the potential to produce the food in the future. And, and I wouldn't call it food security. I would call it efficient food production, much of which will be local because of the environmental consequences of producing it somewhere else. You know, you just have to look around. The idea of flying flower, if anyone looked at the, uh, the cut flower business, when I used to have to drive a van load of mushrooms to Spitalfield Market, I was always looking at the flowers on the side, and we used to go to Cobble Garden too. Um, I mean, these things come from around the world, right? as opposed to British flowers. And if you look at the environmental footprint, it's extraordinary. Okay? And that's what we should get the debate about, how to make the best environmental footprint for what we're doing, and that's all about doing trade properly. That doesn't mean you shouldn't grow flowers abroad, it doesn't mean you shouldn't fly flowers in, but it does mean you should account for those costs against British home production. And it's just an example. Fast fashion's another, there's a whole number of these areas where if we're really serious about efficient outcomes, which also happen to be environmentally benign, we have to take these various costs into account. Otherwise, we'll wipe out our farmers, we'll do a lot of damage to them, and import the stuff instead. And that's not in the environmental interest, it's not in farmers' interests, and it's not in the national interest. And by the way, the public goods won't get produced, because um, back to the one, the one slogan from the NFU, which I definitely agree with, which is, you have to have prosperous farming. Full stop. Thank you, Dieter. That was a hobby horse point, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, Sorry about that. Down here. No, that's fine. Uh, good evening. Thanks for the lecture, Dieter. Um, if you're growing tomatoes in a greenhouse, you have carbon dioxide at a level two and a half times what it is in the ambient atmosphere because plants are in a state of carbon dioxide deficiency. They're yep. suffocating without having it. So if plants are going to vote, on where you set a dial of how much carbon dioxide you'd have in the atmosphere, they'd go way more, please. If you had that dial, where would you set it and why? 
Okay, so, so that's um, a, um, an incredibly important dimension of how you grow stuff. So before my family grew mushrooms, we used to grow tomatoes, lots of them, and carbon dioxide was something you pumped into the greenhouse. And if you look at controlled environments in Dutch, large-scale uh, tomato growing now, you'll see that the gas composition of the atmosphere is managed through time. If you look at indoor farming in the Hutton Institute, you'll see that the bits of the light spectrum are controlled through time. It's all part of divining, devising the optimal frame for growing a crop and where the science and the technology is transformational. So I'm with that, okay? But that's different from asking what you think the carbon con uh, concentration in the atmosphere ought to be out there. Right? And that's where the technology counts. So for the crops you want to grow, as more and more of those crops develop an indoor characteristic, you can control the environment for precisely what you want. And the technology and the data enables you to do that. That is not the same question as asking what you want the climate out there to be. And I'll give you an example. If you want to live with two degrees and you want the permafrost to melt in Siberia and you want that methane to be released in the atmosphere, just remember that not all climate change in the past has been gradual and slow. It's very, very dangerous to go above certain levels and uh, as a species and as a responsible species for this planet, it's perfectly possible that playing around with some of these issues which are most um, explicit in the Arctic at the moment it could be profoundly dangerous and if they are, you won't have any option about controlling what the uh, gases are for your tomatoes and that's an example of technology creating the best environments for the crop that's been grown and the transformation that's taken place particularly in horticulture and Peter knows a lot more about that than I do and not confusing that with the wider climate and what's going on outside Again, you know, give another example. You know, some of the work that people have done about capturing methane, and I, I have no views about indoor or outdoor dairy and cattle, but it's a hell of a lot easier to manage methane inside than it is outside. Right? And there are cycles and systems of capture which enable that to be used as a resource for heating and all sorts of other things, which you couldn't possibly do outside. And I think, not as a good or bad thing, but as a prediction, we're just at the beginning of being able to control a lot of things which have been a wing and a prayer for agriculture for the last 700 years. Thank you. Now, there's one more here. Very quick question, and Dieter, if yeah, you don't mind, a quick answer. It's just and I'm also, in the interim, ask <laughs> Stephen Fell to come up here just to do a brief summary as well. Thank you. Right, last question. Richard Crane from Cambridge. Walk very slowly, Stephen. Um, so I've been, I've been struck by many things to do with what you said, but two, I'm trying to work out, and whilst you're here, I'd like your help. So I'm, I sort of have a guilty thought being a, one well, of my hats, being a uh, farmer of grade three land producing combinable crops, and I haven't dared work out my carbon footprint, which I suspect is not good. I'm also trying to reconcile that to your 2050 view, which is a very real challenge. Do you think, I'm trying to work out what I'm going to be doing in 2050 with the land I want to look after, I want to look after, I want to be profitable. Will I be growing trees? Will I be growing organic food where then I need animals to bring fertility? What do you think my land will look like in 2050? And the right answer to your question is, I don't know and neither do you. <laughs> right? So the whole point about private ownership is you respond to incentives. And they're going to change over time. You could ask me, what do I think the carbon price in five years is going to be? And do I think you're going to pay it? Now that really would change what you do, if it's a big number or a small number. Okay? But you, you have to plan for time horizons. You have to maintain the assets. And if you haven't got a clue how much carbon you're losing, you've probably got quite a lot to do there, may I humbly suggest. Okay? But you also want nimbleness and, and, and flexibility. And you will make up different decisions in 230 than we can possibly imagine today, and probably in 225. That's what farmers do. Right? All I'm interested in is that there is a proper account for the state of natural capital, and we get a better set of incentives on what you do, roughly right, as opposed to being precisely wrong. 
which is the incentive structure we have at the moment, like giving you half price red diesel. Right? Sorry to rub that one in, but I've been working on that quite a lot. Um, so let's, you decide, you run your land, let's, as the public, think about the incentives, about the prices you face for the pollution you cause, let's think about what public goods we can pay you for, and then you make the future. Farmers will make the future, not people like me. People like me stand outside and say, if you want to achieve these broader objectives, this is the kind of incentive structure you want to create for farmers. But you will make the decisions. And the few, that's why the future of our 70% of our land is with you guys, not with academics sitting in an ivory tower. Dieter Helm has been thought-provoking and challenging and given us some serious points to go home with. I hope you will join in with me in thanking him very much for an excellent agricultural lecture this evening.